everyone. Welcome to the November session of Dr. Spotfire. I'm Neil Canungo, and I'll be leading the session today. A quick note about TIBCO. TIBCO is a global technology leader who, for the past 15 years, has helped thousands of customers across various industries enable smarter decision making through data. Whether you need to integrate, analyze, TIBCO is here to help you on your digital journey. For Dr. Spotfire, our slogan is learning is not driven by ants, by learning is not driven by answers, but by questions. Every session we pick up questions posted on TIPCO community and walk through solutions of them. But throughout the session, if you have any questions or feedback, follow-ups, please feel free to post them on the chat. TIPCO is located globally with our Dr. Spotfire Lab based in the US West Coast, where we are broadcasting from today. And this is your Dr. Spotfire crew. Again, my name is Neil Canungo. I'm going to be running the technical Q&A for the second half of this session. Ninad Sawe is on the team. He works hard to make sure we find good feature sessions for you and are able to find the best content out there. Robert Bershenko helps with the post-processing of the session. And Anna is our campaign manager that makes sure you can register, get reminders, and have access to the session. Today's featured speaker is Peter Shaw, a senior data scientist at TIPCO specializing in geoanalytics. Peter will be speaking today on a new reliability analysis template. He will demonstrate how reliability engineers study part failures to characterize the expected lifetime of the full population. Even with just a few parts failing, the lifetime characteristic of the rest of the population can be modeled, which is an especially great advantage when each unplanned failure is costly. This approach provides guidance on designing an effective replacement schedule. And finally, before we go to Peter, I just have one other announcement. Uh, we are excited to inform you that the next evolution of Spotfire is here. Spotfire 10 was made generally available last Thursday, November 1st, and it includes a lot of exciting new features. Uh, this includes a redesigned user interface, artificial intelligence-driven insights, real-time streaming analytics, and an easier data flow management for data wrangling. We're not gonna be going into detail and features during this session, but if you'd like to learn more, you can go to this link at the bottom and you can uh, find some demos and some articles, white papers there for you. For today's session, Peter, Peter, will, Peter will be doing the feature session uh, in Spotfire 10. However, I'm gonna do the Q&A in Spotfire 7. Since many users probably haven't had a chance to upgrade from Spotfire 7 to Spotfire 10 in the in the past few days, uh, so I thought it would be more familiar if I did the Q&A in Spotfire 7, and I'll be doing it in 7.11. All the future sessions will be done entirely in Spotfire 10, however. Okay, with that, Peter, I'll hand it over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Neil. Um, great. So, let me just share my desktop. <clears throat> All right, so I'll be, I'll be talking about a, um, <clears throat> a template on reliability and um, maintenance that will, it will be appearing on the TIPCO exchange. It, we're in the process of putting it up there and getting it finalized. Um, but I thought I would show you this basically in two parts. So the, the first part is just some raw data here. Um, and this is a, a preparatory um, kind of a look at the data and then I'll pop it into the what the, the template, um, the reliability template, and go from there. Um, and we'll be using um, basically a Weibull analysis. And there's, I was looking up, how do you pronounce Weibull? And um, there's like a, a lengthy thing, but I'm, I'm going to go to the Weibull because <clears throat> it depends on what country you're from, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So quite commonly, people say, hey, um, so the, basically the context of this is you're um, looking at some parts, like a, um, maybe in a manufacturing plant, there's some parts that might fail, <clears throat> like some you know pumps or motors or valves or like on your car, your car tires might you know, wear out and fail, stuff, stuff like that. So the, basically the context is you have a large number of parts in very similar operations, so they're sort of identical except that some have failed and some haven't failed. He went to work out what are the characteristics of the failure. So there's um, obviously a much deeper analysis you can do with um, the, uh, the predictors, the, the um, 
associated variables, the the the, the um, the independent variables, basically, if you want to do a full-blown re reliability, you know, um, analysis. But this is purely based on how long the um, units have been in use. So, like, you know, you're supposed to replace your tires after so many thousand miles. That's that's basically what we're after today. So, um, the upshot is going to be, given this handful of little failures we, we have here, <clears throat> what can we say about, hey, what's the best... Um, uh, option for um, determining when to best re replace these guys before they fail. So the table here on the left hand side just shows a bunch of individual units and they've all failed. Um, we have a couple date columns here. This column here shows the date that um, the units were installed. Let's say they were, you're running a, a plant and there were some kind of a, you know, pump and or a motor and that's when they were installed and and they um, they failed at these certain times here so on the right hand side it's kind of a picture of on the x-axis is the date just a chronological calendar date and the um, each um, each connected um, uh, dots here are one unit so here's 10 1091 unit was installed um, at this time and it, it failed a bit later, right? So that's that's basically the, the presentation here. Um, so, and people have come to us and said, hey, what can you say about this? And actually the answer is you can't say very much because what you also need to know is there's a lot more other parts <clears throat> that were put into service at about the same time and that they didn't fail. So really you want to know you're sort of looking at the numerator and denominator, like what fraction fails, so you're missing the denominator here. So you need, some, you need some more information. So if you have a database, you might have a, a table that contains, um, here's, here's the jobs we did, here's the cost associated with the failures. You know, there might be a special table just to list the failures, so um, you kind of have to ask the database folks, okay, can you give me another table that is basically a snapshot of all the currently in service um, units. Like, okay, so let's say these are, are valves somewhere, right? So, so okay, show me all the valves of this type that are currently happily working that have not failed. So it'll be, it'll be a bit of a different picture here. So let's go to the next tab here. So this is Spotfire 10. Um, and you'll see a bit different layout. Well, one thing that's different is that the tabs are on the bottom here. So I'll jump to the next tab here. And so what I have on the left hand side, this is the data and the picture of the parts that failed. This is your snapshot of the database and the picture. So the picture looks pretty different, right? Um, the right hand side, everything's lined up here because that's the date um, of the, the, the date when the snapshot was taken, the data snapshot was taken. So um, let's say it was taken basically like last week sometime, right? So you know, all these other units were installed that sometimes they're they're in service instead of failed <clears throat> um, and they all end at the same time so that's basically you kind of require that information to make any progress with figuring out what the characteristics are for failure and and the reliability so we're, we're going to basically combine these two these two parts to um to do our analysis before we send it to the reliability uh, template itself um, so you'll see that I've actually got a calculated event time, and this is actually, I believe is hours. Um, if you should basically just subtract these two, um, timestamps, right? You get a, you can work out how much time has elapsed in whatever your favorite units are. And by the way, um, this applies to stuff like miles, like, right? So for your tires in your car, this might be expressed in miles or kilometers or whatever, or if you have like a, the cell phone, how how old is the battery? Well, here's how many times it's been charged. So this might be the number of cycles of charge. So it's not strictly time. It can be any kind of unit that expresses um, how much something has been used. So like a battery, you know, um, like my iPhone, it's getting kind of old and the battery just died yesterday before, before I charged it. But, you know, how many cycles does it have? So that, that would be the thing there. So it's not strictly time. That's the thing to keep in mind. All right. The other piece that is also useful is if you do have a record of um, 
if you have done some preventive maintenance in the past, you might also have a record of a data table which shows you, um, that kind of shown here. So um, top one of the failures, the, bottom, the middle one, I, the ones I just showed are the ones that are still in service currently. And the bottom one is um, a picture of ones that were basically replaced after a certain amount of time. So these are all pretty long. So, <clears throat> you know, before these, before the length of time, so this is obviously how, how long it was in service. And before it gets really long, let's say that um, the idea was to replace them at some time before they fail. So, you know, so, so that, that's the base of the deal. So to, to assemble these into a single data table um, suitable for the analysis, I'm just going to jump to the last page here. First of, all, first of all, what we're going to do is we don't actually care about the chronological timestamp. All we care about is the length of time that they were in service before either they were replaced or they failed or they're still in service. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for the purposes of um, the analysis here, these, these bottom two are basically treated the same. Basically, you know, you know that it was in service for some period of time, it, it didn't fail. And so all we care about is it, did it fail or didn't it fail? And so both of these ones didn't fail, so they'll be treated the same. I'll just jump to the last page here. So we're, the last page aligns everything to zero. <clears throat> and I've also changed the colors and changed some of the symbols here. So I basically now, this is no longer chronological time. This is now the elapsed time and hours. So this is where if you have like your miles on your tires, it would be how many miles have you gone or how many times have you charged up your cell phone, how many cycles. So that basically it's, it's now shifted over to the usage. And in this case, it actually is hours. So they're all lined up at zero. <clears throat> the um, white symbols when you've installed them. And one, th one thing that people tend to do is they, they kind of like, you know, it's kind of useful to say, okay, we'll put a big red X, red, you know, for bad and X's means it's been, um, it failed. So that's, that's the failure. These lighter um, green arrows indicates that, well, it was going that kind of points to the right, right? So it's like, it would have, it would have kept on going. It, it could have failed, you know, if you, if it keeps on going, it, it might fail like immediately afterwards, or it might go on a lot much later. You just don't know what's going to happen. So the light, the light ones, the light, the light greens, the light green ones are ones that you um, are still in service from that snapshot. The darker ones are ones that were um, systematically replaced in, the, in, a, in a systematic maintenance program. So when it gets to be about 8,000 hours, in this case, they were kind of replaced there. Um, in terms of organizing the, the table here, um, again, the ones that didn't fail, uh, typically they're the, the word for that is censored, which is kind of a weird word, but it's basically failed or censored. And censored means from a statistical point of view, if you let them run forever, they will fail, right? So the, the idea is they will fail sometime. And you just simply don't know when, when they would have failed, but you know that did go at least this long before you took it out of service or you, before you took the snapshot. Okay, um, I'm going to take this data here and pop it over into the the Weibull template and um, and go from there. <clears throat> so the the Weibull analysis template, and you'll see a, a form of this up on the exchange. It'll probably look slightly different, but um, you bring the data in, and then there's a, a time of the event, um, the column which contains the event itself, and you choose the one that says either censored or failed, and um, which string is the one that <laughs> indicates failure. It might be zero, one, or other things, but you need to kind of specify those. Um, and the probability level, I'll talk about in a moment, so we recompute this, which nothing happens because you need to actually go to the um, next couple plots. So here's the failure plot, which is basically what I showed earlier, where I have the, the red X's. So, be, so in this plot, the, um, the horizontal axis is, again, the time in service is not the chronological time, it's the time in service. So <clears throat> all of the 
this would be aligned to zero as before. So all of the units basically were installed at the left hand side here. And the ones that are in red um, are the ones that failed. And now they've also been aligned from top to bottom in terms of they've been ordered essentially in terms of uh, you know this port this port unit immediately immediately failed right away. But these ones, you know, kept on going and some failed along the way. It kind of the slope kind of changes right here, so it gets kind of a kind of a shelf, if you will. So this is the eight thousand kind of mark where all these units were roughly um, replaced at about the same um, length of time. So you know, they didn't exactly hit exactly eight thousand hours, but that's the um, that's roughly the length of time for that. So this data goes into the reliability analysis, and that's that's, that's the basic form again. This might be the x axis, might simply be the number of charges of your cell phone, or maybe the number of you know, miles on your tire, whatever, but it's just the, the length of time. <clears throat> now, for the variable analysis itself, <clears throat> we have the same plot appearing at the upper left hand side. And I need to actually change my screen here. So, I need to, um, this little button there recomputes things just in case I need to refresh things. Um, the bottom two panels here show it's actually doing a, a fit. So it's actually fitting a formalized Weibull model. You can kind of see the, the, how well the fit is on the right-hand side. So this is the kind of a classic kind of a textbook plot of the analysis. The X and Y axes, they kind of look um, logarithmic, but they're actually this probabilistic thing. So the Y axis is the prob the Y axis is the probability level on this um, scale is similar to a um, logarithmic scale. The x-axis is the time. And all I'm plotting here are the failures. I'm not plotting the um, ones that didn't fail. This is just the failures. So each die here corresponds to one of the failures over on the left-hand side. And the line here indicates how well the, this particular family, the Weibull statistical distribution, fits the data. Now the beauty of the Weibull, so the reason we're doing this, so it's a parametric fit with a Weibull distribution family. The reason we're doing this is a couple of reasons. First of all, um, you know, you might say, hey, for a really, really good fit, I would have 200 failures, it'll make a really good fit. Well, each failure might cost you a lot of money. It's a failure, right? So you want to ideally, you know, if you can get some information out of one failure or two failures or three or something like that. That would be ideal because you don't want to wait for like a million failures because it's going to be, it's very costly. So you're trying to tease as much information as you possibly can out of as few of these failures as possible before other ones happen to give you some time to react to all this. <clears throat> Second thing about, <clears throat> excuse me, about the parametric model is you can then extrapolate into, into the um, future, if you will, into the higher um, usage zone that none of your things currently go. So all, all this data stops after 8,000, you know. So you can actually say, okay, hey, what would happen at 9,000, 10,000? You, you can basically make these forecasts of what would happen if you allowed these things to continue into the future. So that's the, the real beauty of the Weibull. You can basically do a parametric fit um, get the distributions and make these predictions in, into the future. <clears throat> There's also these little curved um, zones, which are the uncertainty, if you will, um, about the fit. I'll talk about the blue lines in a second. Um, down below, there's a couple other plots. This left-hand one is the, the cumulative distribution plot. So on the x axis of both, both of these plots, the x-axis here is the um, Usage again. It's called time, but it's, it's usage. It could be you know miles or whatever. This is actually a, um, a a log plot. So it's that one. And on this one, the the y-axis goes from zero to one, which is the cumulative number that have failed. Right. So it starts at zero. When you first start out, nothing's failed. When you get the very large numbers, they've all failed. And again, this is using the the um, the the Weibull Weibull parameter. So we can actually we can actually run this out as far as we to, um, I don't know, here's 10,000, here's like 100,000, right? So we can, we can have some mean, meaningful estimates of what would happen if you let a unit go out to 100,000, you know, hours. Like, 
guess what? They all fail. So, but that's good to know. And you, you know how it curves up like that. And this other one here is called a hazard function. It's basically saying, it plays a game of, okay, let's say you're at, um, you know, 5,000 hours here. So all these ones to the left have already failed. And you have the model here. So of the ones, it's basically asked the question, of the ones that are still active, haven't failed yet, what's the, essentially the risk per unit time or per unit usage? And it, it, it's going up here. So um, the basis says, as you, as you get to, to these more, your greater and greater time intervals, you're basically talking about the very, very small number that haven't yet failed. So the actual absolute numbers of failures is, is very small, right? But the ratio is, okay, of the ones that are still left, the odds of failing, given that you're out here, is much higher than the odds of failing over the same interval down here because you're worrying out. So that basically, to look at, the thing to look at here is the slope is going up, which means that it's basically a, a wear out mode of failure. Another mode would be a, one that occurs down. If all the failures occur at the very beginning, if you have, if you have, have defect, some kind of manufacturing defect, you have a sort of a burn in, they call it a burn in failure. So, you know, you might want to say, okay, let's, let's turn the machine on for a day, let everything break, it's going to break, and then replace those, then we'll be good for a while. So, that would be the burn in failure. There's another important note for this one, you know, pretty much everything will eventually wear out. So, that, that, um, that covers this part. Um, now, these dash lines here, the blue lines here. I've typed in a probability value of 0.16. And that value is, um, and the, the y-axis of both of these are probabilities. So that shows this little dot, that, this horizontal dashed line or dot, dotted line here, um, where I've typed in that number, and it's the same as this blue line here. Now, um, given that I fitted the model, like I've got all these curves at my disposal, I can simply look up where does this dashed line cross this cumulative distribution function and they'll give me a number in hours um, which is the same as that number here <clears throat> and that's the estimated um, so if, if I give it a probability it'll tell me um, what the number of usage is in other words um, how many hours of, of usage will be where in this case, 16% have failed. So if I say, all right, I want, I, want to, I want to ask when, let's say I want to know what usage level corresponds to 20% of the things failing. So when I hit recompute, these um, lines will jump up to the next thing, to the next thing up, and um, all, the, all the things will kind of shift around a bit. So it's jumped up, um, the intersect has shifted over, and um, Actually, the, the time is shown right here, this little, little plot down, down here, the 6,000, 6, 6,600 um, hours, essentially, corresponding to how long that would be before 20% fails. And there's also, given that this is a statistical fit, I have these error bounds, I can actually get a confidence interval, lower upper confidence interval off that information. So if you start from the point of view of, okay, I went to replace things <clears throat> when 20% fail. I said, all right, replace them at 6,000 units. I say, wait, wait a second, maybe I want to do it when only 10% fail, because 20% seems like a high number, recompute. And this drops down to a lower number, um, and that's only 3,000 <clears throat> um, hours of time before it goes. So this actually is a segue to the next part, which is optimal maintenance, which is to say, all right, how do you know, how do you know is 10% or 20% or is it should it be, should be 1%? Maybe, maybe these failure, failures are so expensive that if one or two fail, it would be just completely catastrophic. So, but then there's a cost of replacement too. So you have to balance the cost of replacement versus the cost of failure. And what is typically considered is that if you replace it with a certain cost, if it fails catastrophically and unexpectedly at the worst possible time, that's going to be a higher cost, right? So it'll be a, it might be like 
twice as expensive or, or 10 times as expensive if the part fails and brings down a much larger system. So um, given these curves we have, we've done all this great fitting stuff, we're going to actually jump over to the optimal maintenance part. And here you see that kind of trade-off balance I was kind of talking about. But to run through this, we have a blue line and a red line, and the sum of the two is this curved kind of green line here. So to start off with the um, red line um, is basically the um, the sort of the is essentially the cumulative number um, that have failed. This actually would eventually curve over and flatten out, but we're only looking at the bottom part of the of the thing here. Um, so the um, actually the y the y-axis here is actually cost in dollars, right? So or re relative cost. So what you do is you you type in um, some kind of a number of time units. I think it was ahead of my mind twelve for months, but but basically the the, the the important part here is that if you call the cost of um, replacement as a one, and let's say it's twice as costly if the part fails unexpectedly, then you recompute this, then you can get this graph here. So um, this graph, again, the x-axis is the logarithmic scale showing the maintenance interval. Um, it, again, we're, we're, you know, the units are replaced about 8,000, which is way out here somewhere. Um, so the, the cost, the, the red line here is the, um, the unplanned cost, right? So if you allow them to fail, if you wait longer, 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 longer between your um, planned maintenance, then your, you know, your cost will skyrocket. If you, if you um, replace the parts very quickly, you can really clamp down on the unplanned cost and get this really under control. But the trade-off, of course, is if you replace them too often, um, you need to think about the blue line. The blue line is the cost of the plan of maintenance. So, you know, if you replace your car tires, there's the cost of your car tires, et cetera. If you, if you replace your car tires every, every few months, man, you really cut down on blowouts so on the highway, but it's really costly. So the, um, this one, um, starts out high and you know it lowers down as you increase the planned maintenance um, intervals so you can really save a lot of money if you don't replace them very often but then you get killed by the unplanned stuff so the sum of the two is your total cost here so and you can look for the the sweet spot or the minimum of this thing and get that the the best maintenance interval here is 141 which is a lot lower than the um, 8,000 I guess Let's say that the, and this, this, this is all made up data. So let's say that the cost for the unplanned failure is, um, let's say it's five times as much as the um, planned maintenance here. So I'm gonna recompute this and everything actually, it basically shifts to the left here. The red part gets a lot steeper. The blue part's the same because it's the, um, the same, um, Plan means, but the, the unplanned got, gets a lot steeper. Everything shifts to the left here, so it really um, begins to lower the, the maintenance thing. Um, That's an interval of like a like ninety one. So um, that's basically the the current ending point of this um, of this uh, template. I'll get back to the thing here really quickly and to point out that if you other ways people use the Weibull framework is to say, all right, let's say I do enough, let's say I have a whole, let's, let's say I have a whole bunch of um, parts in service right now. Some parts started to fail. I want to know what's going on. Um, you know, I can do this quick analysis and, and characterize this. By looking at the cumulative number, I can say, answer questions like, how, how many additional failures can I expect over the next week, right? So given that I've had this let's say there might be some part that has been failing more quickly than I was hoping it would fail. Um, how bad is the problem? How, how, many, how many more failures can I expect over the next you know, month or two months or a week or whatever? So by taking all the parts that are still in service, looking them up on this cumulative graph here and seeing where they'll be in a week, 
they'll be higher. And looking at the difference there, that's the difference in probability. So it's basically the, the probability of the, the incremental probability of failure. Anyways, so um, the point there is that you can do a lot of cool stuff with this, like answer questions like how many will be failing in the next you know, period of time. And how much time do I have? If you, if you first discover there's a problem, <clears throat> it'll help you plan things like, okay, how bad is this? How much time do I have to, um, to fix things before a lot more start to fail? And maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you're discovering things before it really ramps up. So maybe you're discovering some very early failures in some part that will have a lot more failures coming up soon. So it's basically questions like that that this whole analysis can be um, brought to bear to, um, to help you solve the problems. Good, so that's um, basically the walkthrough of the Weibull analysis. I've talked about the data preparation a little bit, um, you know, how to get the data. You basically start with failures. That's basically not good enough. Um, even if somebody hands you, here's my parts that failed, you have to ask them, please tell me all the parts that didn't fail as well. Take a snapshot of your database. Um, do a, a quick calculation. Um, they probably won't have the event times. So you have to calculate this yourself. But it's basically just subtract these two numbers to get the um, usage. If you have the failure, if you, if you have the um, replacement maintenance stuff as well, that's good to know. And then you can put these three together and pop it into the Weibull analysis and um, begin to do this cool stuff. So that's, that's basically the, um, the presentation. So uh, Neil, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thanks, Peter. That was, uh, that was some awesome stuff. I really appreciate you showing us that. It's a really interesting new template. And to all the uh, attendees, um, if you guys have any questions, Peter will be uh, hanging around and answering questions on that reliability template. I wanted to show you guys, um, before we go into the Q&A, this, this TIPCO community page on manufacturing solutions. There's a lot of great content on here. Um, specifically for the manufacturing industry, but it does include some uh, reliability analyses. And uh, there's some links to some different templates here as well. If you guys wanna find templates, remember in the exchange, uh, you can go to Spotfire and you can find a lot of these templates, um, including the analysis that Peter is, has just shown you. So with that, I'm going to move on to the Q&A. First thing I want to go over is uh, remind everyone how they can post their questions and get them answered by Dr. Spotfire. Uh, you can tweet your question with the hashtag Dr. Spotfire and we monitor Twitter for that. You can also post your question to the TIPCO community answer section with the hashtag Dr. Spotfire. Uh, or you can contact Dr. Spotfire directly at drspotfire at tipco.com. Uh, if you have sensitive data, then you probably want to use the email handle. Otherwise, um, you can post through the community answers and we can and we and we prefer to answer it there so other users can benefit from the answers. So now we'll move on to the questions. Uh, the first question is how to get records between a selected year and month. And this was posted by Sunil who uh, did a great job attaching the data and some sample DXPs. Uh, that really helps me uh, see what he was trying to do. And he gave me a little uh, screenshot here, a little diagram of the type of dashboard he was trying to create. And essentially what Sunil is doing is he wants a start and a end date that the user can select from a, a, a dialogue window, um, a, a click window. So they would select the year for the start and the uh, month for start, same thing for end, the end date, and it would show these graphs. So I, uh, I, I created this visualization. I'm going I'm to walk through the steps of how to create such a visualization. Um, he also wanted to show between these dates any new customers that were, were found. So for records where there was a new customer, um, or an existing customer that had new shipments uh, only show the new values. So let's see here. Give me seconds. Okay. So this is the data that Sunil sent. 
And the first thing I want to do is I want to be able to get the month and year values out of the date. So I will add a calculated column and I'll add month and I'll choose the date column. And this gives me month. You can preview it here. And Spotfire is recommending this month expression as a date part data type. And so it actually recognizes those integers as January, February, March, April, May. And I'm going to do the same thing for year to extract the year value out. So now, if I look at my columns, I now have the month and year all shown with each of these records for uh, the sales and the parcel weight and the customer name. So the next thing I want to do is I want to add some document properties. <clears throat> so I'm going to um, in, go to edit document properties and I'm going to create a month start and I'm going to use an integer. I'll just use zero to start. Same thing for end. Year start and year end. I think I actually, I left this as a string, sorry. Make that an integer. Okay. And for, let me just double check this. Okay, good, so they're all integers. Now I'm gonna create a text box. And in this text box, I'm gonna use uh, property controls. So the property controls allows me to create a dropdown list. And I'm going to use a month end dropdown list and a month start. Top list. I'm going to do this. I'm going to start actually with a month start, and I'm going to use the uh, the unique values in the month column. Just save that. It's creating that drop down. So I'm going to do the same for the year. Unique values and I'm going to do year. Right here, I'll just write start, and I just need to do the same for the end. So, let's see, unique values, and And one more. <clears throat> Drop down list, year end, and I'm going to do unique values and year. So now what I have is an ability to select these years and the months for the starts. So January 2018, let's see, or I'll do 2016 and I'll end on March 2018. But I need to tie this to my visualizations as well. So uh, what I can do is on my document properties, I can go to data and I can add a limiting expression. And I want to find the dates that are between these two ranges. So I created this expression, which I'll walk through real quick. What it's going to do is look at the date column, if it's greater than or equal to, and then this is a date, const I'm constructing a date here using the date function. So the date function has the syntax where you can add the year, comma, the month, comma, and the day. 
So I took my year start document property for my year. The way you do that, I'll show you is you, you go to year start, you right click and you go insert as value. I did the same thing for month start. I did I right clicked and I did insert as value. And then I just picked the first day of the month. Uh, Sunil didn't uh, specify what day of the, uh, what the, if the day of the actual start and end date should be in there. So I'm just using the first date of the month through the first day of the end month. So if it's greater than the start date and it's less than or equal to the end date, then show those values. So we're gonna hit okay, hit close. So now it's only showing January through March for the values that are available. Now to create those charts, um, I can duplicate this visualization. I'm going to switch it to a bar chart. And on properties, I'm going to go to data and I'm going to use that same expression. It's right here for me. So I'm going to just insert it, hit okay. And uh, one of the charts he had, he wanted to see the sales per customer. So over here, I will do sales. And now I have this chart changing based on the dates I have showing as well. And quickly, I just want to show you some cross tables. They'll come up again in, an, in another question. So he wanted to see a list of the new customers. So I'm going to duplicate this visualization and I'm going to switch it then to a cross table. And the reason I duplicated it is it will maintain, it will keep that expression. So I'll have to put it in again. So now this, this is showing sales. I want to show actually the row count to show the number of new customers during this time period. So as I change this, you can see the number of new customers. And just to show you that's the number of new ones, if I duplicate this again and I go to data and I remove the filter, this is all the customers and all their counts. And then this is just the changing one. So now you're seeing the new value there. So that's question one. Uh, thank you, Sunil, for your question. Um, I did a little bit more here. If you guys want to look, you can change the parcel weight as well. Um, and there's a few different charts, Sunil, that you had requested. So if you just look at the column selectors I, I showed. So question two um, is a dynamic fiscal quarter. So for this one, um, the user wanted to use the fiscal offset feature in Spotfire, but for, for changing fiscal year. So let me pull up, here we go. Okay, so if you guys weren't aware already, um, if, you have a, if you have some dates and you wanna show them um, based on a fiscal year, you can use the fiscal year hierarchy right here. Now, if you go to document properties, there in every document, there is a fiscal year offset where some companies, companies are allowed to choose whenever they want their fiscal year to end. So if one, one maybe wants to, to have it end in November, you can hit okay, and now it'll actually shift it. So Q1, is now in December rather than Q1 being uh, starting in January. So if I go to zero here, it'll shift it by the number of months. Now Q1 starts in January, Q4 ends in December. But how do you do this dynamically? This is only a static way to do it. So what you're gonna do is um, you're, you're going to Create your own fiscal offset by going to calculated column, and you're going to use this expression. And I'm going to preview it. So what this is doing is it's taking the month of the fiscal year end. I'm doing it from the end, and um, it's subtracting 12. I have these. Uh, six companies, they all have different fiscal year ends or mostly different fiscal year ends. 
So I want to see the month of what this column is. I want to see this month, and I want to subtract 12 from it to get that offset. So I'm creating a fiscal offset. Okay. Now, just to show you what's happening here, I'm going to add these new columns automatically. So here, there's no fiscal offset when the year ends in December, but as you get to years ending in um, November and October, you have some different fiscal year offset. The next thing you want to do is insert a calculated column for uh, your adjusted month. Um, you or your adjusted quarter, sorry. So fiscal quarter is a function you can use where you can actually put the date and then you can put the offset. Now, and one of the things with Spotfire is it only accepts a static value here, an integer value here. So if I wanted to actually do this by each of the columns or each of those fiscal offsets I just created, it won't actually work. It'll give me an error. So it gives me this error. So a way around this is to actually just do each line uh, separately. There's this expression I built. You only have to do it from 0 to negative 11. And what it's going to look at is the case when the fiscal offset is negative 11 then it will just use that static value in that expression. Fiscal quarter, date, negative 11. And you just do it negative 11, negative 10, all the way up to zero. And uh, when you format it, you, it's a date part format, and you can use a type of quarter. And so now when you preview it, you can actually see this is a quarter. And I'm gonna just call this adjusted quarter. I'm going to do this one more time for fiscal year real quick. So this is now using the fiscal year, not fiscal quarter function. And we're going to hit OK. So now um, I want to be able to show these, even though these are changing end of fiscal years, I want to show them all in the same chart. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the adjusted quarter. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have used, just so it's not confusing. I'm gonna actually rename this as to adjusted year. Okay. So I have the adjusted quarter added on here. Now um, I'm gonna select some other columns. I'm gonna so, uh, select the adjusted year. So I want it in this, hierarchy, so 2018, and then I have, above the years, I have the quarters. The, another th the last step I want to do is do create a hierarchy by right-clicking and, and going create hierarchy. You can now use this slider to look at years and quarters. And hierarchies can be created not just for fiscal days. It can be created for any columns. You can create these hierarchies. But I wanted to show you this. Now this is behaving in the same way that the default fiscal year uh, function was. Okay, I'm going to move on to question three. So question three wanted, it has a, a user, a J. He wanted to have a slider, um, a filter slider that would lock in at 12 months, so not allowing users to select, you know, six months or seven months or 13 months. Um, so what I'll show a quick way to go through this. One second here. Okay. So here is um, a Jay's. Uh, I, I created actually some fake data uh, with just some shipments and these dates. I just used the first of the month. Um, from October 15th through October 28th, or October 2015 through October 2018. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is create a text box. 
and I'm going to add a keep doing that. I'm going to add a property control, and I'm going to add a slider. So here I need to create a document property uh, for this slider that whatever value the slider is, it will write to this this value. So I'm going to just call this a start date. And I'm going to make it a date data type, and I'll just put May 1st, 2018 on here, just for a starting value. Oh, I'm, yeah, 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 that's right. And then what I want to be able to do is set the property through unique values in the date column. So this is going to pull off that first column I had of all those dates. Uh, from October 2015 through uh, October 2018. I'm going to hit OK. And we're going to hit Save. And I now have a slider here for one for a date, right? But it's not doing anything. And I'm going to just write start date here. Okay, so I have a start date, and I want to lock this into 12 months. So what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to go to the uh, limiting expression, and I'm going to use this function that I wrote. And what this is, is if the date is greater than the document property of start date, which is whatever this slider is in. So again, to add a document property, you go to start date, you right click and you insert value. So it's greater than or equal to that date and it's less than or equal to a year after that. And I use the date add function. In the date add function, you use the date column, um, or sorry, you can use uh, the, the syntax year here. So I'm gonna use a year interval and we're gonna put the value and then the date column. So I wrote year, so that's my interval. I want to increase it by one year, and I want to increase it from this start date. So it's going to filter from the start date to a year after the start date, and I hit OK. Now I have July 1st, 2016 to July 1st, 2017. That's exactly 12 months. As I move this, I'm getting the same thing. I'm getting the, the one-year intervals, okay? So that's a quick way to do that. Moving on to the next question. How do we join two columns from one data table to one column of another data table in Spotfire? Um, Kushbu uh, actually beat me to this, and so I upvoted her and I marked it as uh, answered. Um, to do this question, you, I'll, I'll sh first show you the, let's see, question four, sorry, let me get this up. There's two tables, so even though Kushbu answered this, I wanted to go over it with you guys. Um, you, this user wants to add to one table an or, using an or statement of two other match columns from another table. And so what I created for her table B is um, these different roles and where the job location is. And for table A, there's these applicants where their hometown is and their desired city. Um, so what you will do is you will unpivot and then you will match with the, uh, that table B column. So let me pull that up here. I've added the table B in, and what I'm going to do is add now um, insert columns, and I'm going to select from that table A, and I'm going to use an unpivot when I add. And I want to pass through applicant, and I want to unpivot the home in the desired city. So I'll say this as type, and I'll say this as location, and I'll hit OK. 
I'll go to next. I just need to match my location and my job location. I will select both of these columns and I hit finish. And now, as you can see, there is the different role. This is an or statement where it's added um, based on the hometown or desired city is indicated in this column. And over here in the applicant column, you can see the names that match. Um, if you note from my spreadsheet that um, the desired city is only New York or Chicago, and you can see here in desired cities, they're either only Chicago or New York, desired city, New York. So that's a quick check for that. We're going to go on to question five. Um, this is a quick question. Uh, Juan was asking about adding a uh, column um, to count the number of Bs uh, in a column that has values A and B. Um, there are two ways to do this. Um, the way Juan um, had this, he you instead want to insert a calculated uh, column with the correcting the syntax he had. So if column B is equal to one, then uh, or column if column if the column is B, then you show one. Otherwise, show zero. And I'll just say um, expression one. So now this is showing ones and zeros. If I create a cross table on this, it's showing the sum um, of this. A better way to do this, however, is to use the expression uh, with the over function. So it's a count of my column over the, uh, over the uh, column itself. So I'm gonna say this as expression two. And to show you this. Now this is showing a lot lar larger value because what it's doing on expression two is it's actually repeating the value for each count of this. So if you don't wanna do that, you can just do average and that will just show you the actual count. Or if you're trying to look at percent total, which is what Juan was asking about, you can use percent total and this will give you a proper distribution of percent total. Um, which is 77% here and 23% uh, there. Note that if you do percent total with this first method, it won't work. It's just gonna give you only the ones and it's not gonna give you anything for zero. So the better way to do it is to use that over function. And uh, now for my last question, um, Zero was asking about a rolling filter not working. Now I wanted to point out that Zura included DXP, which was good, but Zura uh, unfortunately did not include the data, so I couldn't actually open this up and look at the data. Um, so Zura, if you want to repost your, your uh, sample DXP and include the data, use one of these two options in the source view, and this is a good note for all users to include the data. Um, I took a look at this and I was not able to replicate the issue. Um, I created a moving average over six months, and Zura's question was when he uses filters, he was saying I was breaking it. When I use filters, it seems to be just fine. So this red value is the six months. Um, as a comparison, when I'm using different intervals um, here on this yellow line, it all seems to be looking fine for me. So Zura, if you want to post some more details about your question, include the data, uh, I'd love to try and help you out on the TIPCO community. Okay, everyone, that's it for today's Dr. Spotfire. Thank you for attending, and we hope you attend next time.